before I start talking about the Century Farm, I thought I'd like to tell you how the hops got to Iowa. So John Cox Hop was my great-great-grandfather, and the middle name Cox was his grandmother's maiden name. And in going through history and researching, they seem to do this a lot, taking maiden names to become children's or grandchildren's either first name or middle name. So anyway, John Cox Hop was born on January 4th, 1842 in Brook County, West Virginia. Of course, then that was still Virginia, but so it's, it's up in the north finger uh, or thumb uh, near Wheeling. Um, he married Margaret Bennett on September 28, 1863. And as Max will tell you, that was the middle of the Civil War. Um, <laughs> And they got married in Wheeling. Uh, she was the daughter of Hiram and Sarah Bennett and was born in 1844 in Wheeling. Um, John and Margaret came to Iowa as newlyweds. Now, whether they left right after they got married or <coughs> soon after, but they were here uh, when my great-grandfather was born in August of 1864. So I'm thinking they probably left soon after they got married. And um, with them came his widowed mother and his siblings. John was the oldest. He would have been about 21, 22. And his father was killed by Indians in 1853. So it seems to me a lot of responsibility fell on John at a very young age. And um, so they came, to, they came west. And the National Road, which the government had built or was building, um, went right through Wheeling. So my thoughts are that they probably came on the National Road, which goes through Ohio and Indiana and Illinois. And when they got to Fairfield, they really liked it. The farmland was rich and the soil was black. And so they decided they would stay for a while. So they uh, settled in Polk Township, which is um, Abington, near Abington, and uh, bought a farm uh, there and... Uh, that's how the hops got to Iowa. Oh, they came in a, in a covered wagon, too. Can you imagine? How long would that have taken? <laughs> a long time. Um, so they had um, uh, four children, or five children. Joseph Decatur, John Ellsworth, Virginia, Clorinda, and Maddie. I don't know what their middle names were. Uh, and in the 1900s, they must have moved because I've been able to find that they had land uh, at uh, Burkhart. Is that Burkhart? Is that it? Um, Bernhardt. Bernhardt. Bernhardt, Bernhardt okay. which is just west of Fairfield. Um, later they moved to Missouri, and uh, then finally they ended up in Philadelphia, and that's where they're buried. So that's my great great grandparents. Um, so Joseph Decatur was their first child. He was my great-grandfather. He's the one that bought the farm at Libertyville. So he was born on August 25th, 1864. And that is significant because my father was also born on August 25th. And he always was so proud to have the same birthday as his grandfather. Um, so. Um, Joseph was born uh, in Ab in a farm on a farm near Abington in Polk Township, and he was a lifelong resident of Jefferson County. And on February 22nd of 1888, he married Sarah Arabelle Curry, and she was from Locust Grove Township, which is just the township to the south, and she was from a farm north of Batavia. Maybe where you live, Becky? I don't know. Anyway, the Currys were not far from where you, your farm is. Anyway, I digress. So uh, she was the daughter of William and Lucinda Henderson Curry. And uh, they, their first homestead was west of Cross Lanes. Uh, and um, uh, Sarah went by the name Bell, short for Arabelle. And uh, Joe seems like he always went by his initials, everything I've seen. It's JD, JD, JD. So, um, and um, they had four children Pearl, William, John, and Claude. Um, they all four went to country school at Cross Lanes. And in 
1906, J.D. and Bell bought and moved to the farm immediately to the west of Cross Lanes, uh, to, right next to the schoolhouse. Uh, and they lived there until their deaths. Uh, Bell was a member of the Cross Lanes Presbyterian Church. She died December 4th, 1947. And J.D. died May 9th, 1949. Uh, and they're buried in the Evergreen Cemetery. Uh, I just briefly want to mention their four children. Uh, Pearl Savannah uh, was their oldest, and she never married but lived at home uh, with her parents and helped around the home and the farm. She was born February 6, 1889, and was a member of the Cross Lanes Club and the Cross Lanes Presbyterian Church. And she really enjoyed visiting with neighbors and friends, and I can remember her. Um, and um, after her parents' death, she moved to an apartment here in Fairfield on West Burlington Street. Uh, she died on May 4th, 1957, and is buried beside her mother and father. William Earl, known as Bill, was the second child, and he was born June 12th, 1891, and farmed in Jefferson County all of his life. On March 28th, uh, 1933, he married Mary Ruth Whitmore Black, and she was born in 1892 near Batavia, and attended Parsons College and taught school in rural Jefferson County. She was a member of the Cross Lanes Presbyterian Church. Uh, they had no children, but they raised her grandson, Marvin Black. Uh, Ruth died uh, in 1958, and Bill died December 16, 1981. He was just very proud to have reached the age of 90. Uh, They're both buried in the Batavia Cemetery. John Randolph was my grandfather. He was the third child, and he was born May 1st, 1893. And after uh, his eighth, eighth grade, eight years of schooling, he, he started farming. And um, on April of 1917, he was drafted into the Army. Uh, he was trained as a grenadier, and a grenadier is a hand grade, a grenade thrower. Mm. <laughs> and um, he uh, was trained with M Company, 350th Infantry, and then in May of 1918, he was sent to France with the AEF 88th Division, and he was ordered to the front lines on November 18th, 1918, which, as you know, that was Armistice Day, so he didn't have to go. Luckily, he, he didn't get in on any, any fighting. He returned home in March of 1919 to the farm near Libertyville, where he would live for the rest of his life. Um, Claude Joseph, or Uncle Claude as I remember him, um, he was the youngest. He was born July 27th, 1897 and died January 25th, 1978. He married Eula Rainier. Uh, she was, uh, they got married in 1938. She was born in Ollie, but she grew up near Packwood. Uh, she graduated from Parsons College and taught school and also served as principal in Cleo, Cleo is that, am I pronouncing that right? Uh, and um, <coughs> Salem schools prior to their marriage. Uh, she was a member of the Cross Lanes Club in the Libertyville United Methodist Church. Um, she died in August of 1986. They had no children. They farmed immediately north of the Cross Lanes School. So JD's farm was to the west and their farm was to the north. Um, in 1976, they retired and moved to Fillmore Street here in Fairfield. They're buried in Evergreen Cemetery. So that's the little bit of history. Uh, on September 8, 1916, J.D. purchased the, the farmland, 219 acres at, uh, in Liberty Township, just north of Libertyville. And John and Bill farmed this place together for many years. And they were both unmarried at this time, and there were two houses on the farm, but I'm pretty sure they just lived together in one of the houses. <laughs> um, in February of 1924, uh, John and Bill bought an adjacent parcel consisting of 79 acres, which became the northeast corner of the farm, or in lawyerese, the northeast corner of the northeast corner. Um, so that brought the farm uh, up to about... Uh, Almost 300 acres, I guess. Um, 
Uh, on January 19, 1927, John married Mabel Carlson. She was the daughter of Andrew and Matilda Anderson Carlson of Fairfield. And she was born August 15, 1983, near Heitman, which is in uh, Monroe County. Uh, Bill lived with them until his own marriage. Can you imagine this? You're living with your brother and his wife. Anyway, uh, <laughs> that's what they did. Um, and Bill lived with them until his own marriage in 1933. And then Bill and Ruth moved into the other farmhouse on the farm. Um, in, in September of 1945, John bought Bill's half of that 79 acres and, um, that they had purchased together. And in 1947, John purchased 120 acres across the highway, which I'll always call 303, even though it's V64 now. Um, but so they had 120 acres on the east side of the road, and the rest of it was on the west side. And the other factor was the railroad was through there, so the, the, the farm was really cut up. The road, the railroad, but anyway. Um, after J.D.'s death, uh, his farms were divided among all of his children, and Pearl, Bill, and Claude received land in Locust Grove Township, and, and Grandpa John received the land in Liberty Township. And at, it was at this time then that Ruth and Bill moved to the home place there, west of Cross Lanes. Okay, which brings us to Grandpa and Grandma, John and Mabel. Um, they spent their entire married life on the Libertyville farm. Uh, they lived in a large two-story white farmhouse with a white picket fence. And early farming was done with draft horses and a lot of hand labor. Uh, the first tractor was a 1942 John Deere B, but John liked horses. So he always kept a team of horses on the farm well into the 1960s. He hitched them up almost every day and he did chores like haul hay and sugar, which was his name for manure. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember hauling sugar with Grandpa. Um, uh, in addition to horses, animals raised on the farm were hogs, cattle, there were a few milk cows and uh, chicken or poultry, different kinds of poultry. Grandma liked chickens. Uh, the crops were corn, soybeans, oats, and alfalfa. Um, Mabel raised a large garden every year uh, and took care of the chickens, the bantams, and the guinea hens. I know my cousin Linda particularly likes chickens. <laughs> um, she, was a, she was a good cook, and uh, her mashed potatoes and gravy were the best. Uh, her black raspberry pie was made with fresh berries from the garden and was delicious. They had three children, Glenn, Raymond, and Doris, who all went to Libertyville School and graduated from Liberty, Libertyville School. And in 1952, John and Mabel had a new house built on the farm. It was much smaller and was only one story, but it still had the white picket fence. Uh, the house is still there today, but sadly, the picket fence is not. Um, John was a member of the American Legion. He died on June 22, 1969, and Mabel died March 9, 1988, at, at age 94. They were both members of the Libertyville Faith United Methodist Church and are buried in the Evergreen Cemetery. Glenn Joseph, he got his grandpa's birthday and his grandpa's name. <laughs> was the first child of John and Mabel, and he was, as you know, he was born on August 25th, 1927, which is also his grandpa's birthday. He attended Libertyville School K through 12, and he was the only one in his class to have gone there for all of his schooling. Uh, in the summer of 44, he attended the American Legion Boys, Iowa Boys State, and that's a week-long hands-on experience in uh, the operation of a democratic form of government. Uh, in high school, he lettered in both baseball and basketball. He was a good athlete. He was a starting forward guard on the 1943-44 team that won the Jefferson County Basketball Championship. And in baseball, he played shortstop and sometimes third base. Uh, and while it's still in high school, he was invited to try out for both the Chicago, Bear, or Chicago Cubs and uh, the St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, but he was, he was young, and he didn't make the trip to the big cities because of his age. But 
he told me uh, that he always wondered if he could have made it in the big leagues. <laughs> um, he graduated May 17, 1945. He was vice president and valedictorian of his class. He continued to play baseball in various town teams in the area, uh, Batavia having one of the better teams, and he did finally get to make it to play with the Batavia Bees. Um, after uh, high school, he also uh, was a high school referee and umpire. And I can remember when I was about three, uh, he refereed uh, his sister's basketball games. And um, I, for some reason, thought I needed to walk across the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so he had to call time and pick me up and take me back to my mom. <laughs> um, uh, he farmed with his dad. Uh, and on May 1st, 1949, 75 years ago, he married Ina Sheets, his high school sweetheart. Uh, she was the daughter of William Curtis and Lou Anna Reese Sheets and grew up on a farm about two and a half miles west of Libertyville. She attended country school at Des Moines Number 8 and then high school at Libertyville. And tonight, uh, Mrs. Doherty brought something from Marilyn uh, Booth Nance whose mother, Velma Williams, before she was married, uh, was my mom's school teacher at number eight. Just a little note from her and a picture. Um, <clears throat> uh, and then after uh, attending uh, uh, country school and high school, prior to their marriage, she worked at Sears in Ottumwa. <clears throat> And she was there at the time of the flood of 1947. And probably some of you can remember the flood of 1947. Maybe not. I don't know. If, uh, if, but you it are, was, if you are interested, there's a newspaper downstairs yeah, covering yeah, it. Was just a, the way the flood had hit it was, somewhere. Yeah, it was really a big flood. Um, their first home was on the land east of 303 uh, in an old farmhouse. They had a daughter, Marcia. That would be me. Um, and Glenn's brother, Raymond, who had just gotten back from Korea, wanted to farm also. And so um, splitting the income three ways just didn't work out very well because nobody had really had a good living. So my dad, Glenn, stepped aside. And uh, in March of 1956, he found some land to rent in Wapolo County. And the family moved. Uh, to that farm northeast of Ottumwa. Uh, at this time, John gave Glenn the 1942 John Deere B, <laughs> which um, my understanding is, as a war tractor, it was different from other tractors. It didn't have any lights, for one thing. And um, my friend Max here probably can tell you some other things about that tractor, about why it was a war tractor. And when they come down the line, the air cleaner on it was red which made it a forestry air cleaner or something. And some of the other parts underneath of it were yellow, which would have been industrial or something. So they gathered up the parts and they built it, and that's what was assembled at the time when they come down the line. Okay, thanks, Max. I, I couldn't remember everything you told me. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, Farming years start March 1st, so they would have moved. Uh, but they wanted me to finish kindergarten at Libertyville, so I stayed with Grandpa and Grandma and, uh, for about 10 weeks and uh, finished school uh, so that I could complete kindergarten uh, in Alfreda Bonnet's class, which you, some of you know who I'm talking about. Um, and um, uh, Mom and Dad always raised a huge garden. And um, uh, mom did a lot of canning and freezing of, of fruits and vegetables every summer. She was a wonderful cook and a baker and a seamstress and enjoyed refinishing antique furniture. Uh, Glenn loved farming, raising livestock. Uh, he sold the cow corn, seed corn, and McCubbin's seed beans for many years. In uh, October 1967, 
they bought a 100 acre farm three miles east of where they were renting and they leased that farmhouse out until they moved there themselves in 1972. Uh, in September of 1986, they bought a house and moved into agency and sort of, sort of semi-retired. Um, after uh, Mabel's death in 1988, uh, Glenn purchased Doris's, his sister's share of the Liberty Oil Farm. And uh, on November 15, 2004, he bought 31 acres that was right in the middle of the farm on the west side. Uh, and that was, I think, was part of Carl Jenkins' farmland. Um, you're nodding yes, so I think I must be right. <laughs> uh, um, that was on the west side of the highway. Uh, Mom died on April 29th, 1996. And Dad died <clears throat> February 23rd, 2022 at age 94, and he, he always told me that he wanted to live longer than his mom. She was 94 and five months. He was 94 and six months. <laughs> uh, mom and dad were both members of the Bladensburg Christian Church, and they're buried in the Batavia Cemetery. I just want to mention dad's siblings because they grew up on that farm. Uh, Raymond John <coughs> was the second child of John and Mabel, and he was born January 9th, 1930. He attended Libertyville School and graduated in 1948. He served in the Army during the Korean conflict, and after returning home from Korea, he farmed with his dad for several years and then lived with his parents. Uh, he married Donna Montha Davis on September 17th, 1964. They had no children, but Donna had four children from a previous marriage. Raymond was a member of the American Legion, the VFW, and the Iowa Association of Veterans Affairs Commissioners. He died on November 3rd, 1982, and Donna died on September 25th, 2003. They were both members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and are buried in the Smith Cemetery north of Batavia. Doris Elaine was uh, John and Mabel's youngest child, was born on February 21st, February 21st, 1936. She attended Libertyville School and played basketball, which she loved very much. Uh, she always liked sports, so did Dad. They could get together and talk about sports and politics all day long. <laughs> she graduated in 1953 and then attended Iowa State Teachers College in Cedar Falls and graduated from Parsons College with a BS in elementary and physical education and taught fourth grade in Argyle, Lone Tree, and New London. She married Wesley Totemeyer, uh, October 6, 1961, and they farmed in the New London area and had two children, Stacy and Glenn, and more naming of, you know, family members. They, I remember Doris asking Dad if, she, if he minded if she named her son Glenn. He said, of course not. <laughs> um, Glenn is deceased. Stacy is married to Dennis Spidell, and they live in Mount Pleasant. Um, and they had three children, Elizabeth, Daniel, and Andrea. Wesley died in uh, 2010, and Doris died April 19th of 2012, and they are buried in Everett Green Cemetery next to Mabel and John. And finally, um, the farm op farming operation of the Libertyville Farm has been conducted by neighbor Don Daly for simply decades. I can't even tell you how long Don's farmed that farm, but uh, and that's, that's what I have for the history. Wonderful. As soon as I saw your smile when you walked in the door, I knew there was something, and you had at least three or four Parsons College folks. Yeah. If it hadn't been for Parsons College, I'd still be in Ohio, so I, I'm glad that I was able to share with it. Parsons College was here for, right, was here for 98 years. It closed in 1973. It was the last graduating class on that, so. I'd like to open it up. If any of you have questions and you would like to pose them, I will try and repeat them so we can pick this. So please. Marcia, you mentioned that there were cows on the farm. Was uh -huh. it a dairy farm? Did you no, sell the milk? Beef cows. Oh, beef, well, beef cows. cows. And okay. back, in, back in the day, um, my, I can remember dads going to Chicago with, with the cattle when they sold them because um, you sold them live. Uh, there was, the refrigeration didn't exist back then, so 
you, you loaded them up at Bernhardt and you went into Chicago with them. And I found a postcard that <laughs> Dad had bought when he was in Chicago, and it was addressed to Mom. It was before they were married. And he said, I bet you're surprised I'm in Chicago. <laughs> he said, I, de I decided to come in with the cows after all. But it was kind of typical. He, he never mailed it. He just gave it to her when he got back. <laughs> he get back before the postman. I don't know, <laughs> but I, I found that I found that. I thought, well, Dad had I I found a Valentine that he bought for me in his desk drawer after he died. I'm just like, okay, this is what he does. <laughs> okay. Yeah, they took them uh, take, on the train. Take the cows into Chicago on the train is the question. Yeah, yeah, they took them on the train and sold them, and then they came back on the train. Um, and I, I, I think that's just the way it was done back then. Big stockyards in Chicago or Omaha, and I, I, Chicago is probably closer for us here than Omaha. He'd have been better off going to the St. Louis Cardinals because uh. they had a better winning <laughs> St. Louis Cardinals. Huh? Okay. Grandma was a big St. Louis Cardinal fan. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we're, we're right in the middle here, and some people still like the Twins, but the Cubs and yeah. the Cards are they're definitely the favorites in this territory. For sure, for sure. Other questions? Dennis, did you have a question? I got a comment that's maybe pertinent. Upstairs in your display is a Libertyville check flag. Yep. And I don't, I didn't look at the period of the year, but it, it looks like some that I found in Creek Oil Station when I bought it out. Oh, there. yeah. And uh, Jimmy back here uh, found some checks in there and the ones I found that his grandfather had signed and it, it has, uh, a one, let's see, 1920 blank, 192 blank. And if it was the year of 27 or 28, they wrote that in there. Mm -hmm. Well, those check blanks, I found out, were good for 10 years. Counter checks. Yeah. And everybody used that on their account, and they'd write the year in. Yeah. The company would that they buy from. And then on one of them, on some of those checks, they had run out and didn't get any new ones yet, and it's got the um, twenty cross, the two cross, nineteen thirty one. Yeah. 30, and I think it went out to two years or three years before they quit doing that. Yeah. They had some nineteen. Yeah, I, I, I can remember those counter checks. But things were tight. Yeah. And people used their heads on how to spend money and how to save yeah. money. That was just one way they saved by not having check blanks every year, throwing some away they couldn't use, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. I, I found three I found three checks that grandpa had written. The one in the display is to the Libertyville harness shop. Okay. So I thought that was the one to put in. Uh, but there I think there was also one to Creek Oil, if I'm not yeah, mistaken, uh, and I, I can't remember who the other one was too, but uh, found a shoebox full of them. Yeah, Creek yeah, and the uh, the checkbook uh, that's up there in the display was my dad's from the early '50s, '54, no. something like that, '50, 50, <coughs> '53. So I I put those in too. Well, it's like you were talking. Your brother, or one of the brothers, lived with a brother for a while. And it was just common. But yeah, <laughs> they probably used the same checkbook. With what they had. Maybe he didn't mail that postcard because he didn't have a stamp. That was probably part of it. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's the thought that counts with him, right? <laughs> well, we've come a long way from counter checks to pre-printed to debit cards and all the electronic stuff that we've got to try and put up with, but I'm, I'm glad that you're able to resurrect those. We, we had uh, some receipts that were given to us the other day from a contractor working on a, working on a project, and it had the same type of 1903, and then you fill in the last year on the receipt copy. So it was commonplace at that time. Back in that period. Yes, for sure, for sure. Uh, anyone else that would like to pose a question or share a, a thought or a comment that you've observed or that you've lived? I'll share the check stories. Please. This one on my dad had a check that we bring that was taken out. Well, the check was a loan from the 
Tavia Bank on the 23rd of December for $5. <laughs> <laughs> he was going shopping. <laughs> <laughs> you think that think that may have been to buy some Christmas presents? <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Well, good. I am so pleased that we have all these smiling faces to come to give you support yeah, on you. here. And too. it is just, it's a joy to continue to learn where we are, where we've been, and the virtues of lineage and ancestry. As I shared with Marsha, we've had groups in here where we've had seven generations, 150, 160 years, and it just continues on. And then I look at Dennis, and I look at your dad Everett, and you, and your son David, and then Mike coming along, and you, you follow those things coming through, and it means a lot to people. Please. Uh, Marsha was only child for a lot of years, and her family sure loved her. <laughs> Grandpa and Grandma, her mom and dad loved her so much. But you didn't mention when you were born in there anywhere. Well, I'm, um, I was born on March 17th, yep, 1950, so along with my cousin Linda on the very same day. <laughs> uh, I was born in the morning. Linda was born in the afternoon. And thank you, Linda, for being here tonight. And thank you, all my friends and family, came a distance to be here with me, and plus the, the locals, I, I really appreciate it. If you did not have a chance when you came in, because some people, they came right to the second floor, the display that they're talking about is on the third floor. You can use the elevator to go up, and you get off the elevator, turn to your right, turn to your right, and follow to the north end, and they have a beautiful display cabinet that is designated each month and refurbished with the brand new family on that. And so if you didn't get a chance, please go up and take a closer look and, and look for a check stub or look for something else that you've heard about here because they're, they're all there and it is so neat to see it happen. Marcia, any closing comments that you'd like to share? Um, I, I just, uh, I remember Charlotte said to me, don't forget the ladies when you have your display done. <laughs> and so I tried to include both farm and home uh, in my display. And um, I, I, I think Scott just did a wonderful job putting this display together. I'm so very, very pleased. Um, and uh, I'm sure maybe some of my relatives might recognize some things in, in the display. So th thanks so again for Marcia, coming. I noticed that Angel Food Cake Pan. Yes. Was that your mother? That was my mom's. And oh, every, she must every. Have taken wonderful care for it. I got an angel food cake every year for my birthday um, because I think she thought I was an angel. <laughs> I, I, I think Linda got a devil's food cake. <laughs> but we celebrated our birthdays together all the years uh, through school. And then um, I went to college, and Linda got married and had a family, and then when we turned 50, we started celebrating again. And um, we did that until COVID hit, and then it kind of went by the wayside. But uh, we celebrated over half of our birthdays together. Wonderful. Well, I thank you all for coming. Thank you for the dialogue interaction. And I didn't mention Charlotte's name earlier, so I'm going to do it again, but Charlotte Wright here with the right here in the pet in the she is one of our angels that you talk about that keeps this Carnegie building going she and Jake Smith together make good stuff happen and so thank you for oh, oh excuse me he was behind a smiling face here okay there you go so so we do have part of our staff and volunteers that are are here to help celebrate this event so if there, without further ado, we will say thank you very much for coming and thank you Fairfield Media for putting this together and it will be available for family, friends, other folks that might not have been able to be here to, uh, to be able to access on the computer from there. So we appreciate your time and if you, like I said, if you hadn't been to the third floor, please take the time to do that. You're welcome to stay here as long as you want and visit and uh, we will uh, move forward from here. Thank you all very much for being in attendance. Thank you.